Hello, heroes. Welcome. Now, today we have a very exciting event with you uh, for you guys, and um, we have the honor to have a, a guest, the past guest that coming back. Uh, we have with us attorney Brian Ledmer, who is really the top notch attorney that you could think of when it comes to parental alienation in Canada. So he's going to be talking to us today about the legal, social, and therapeutic development in Canada. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for being back here with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So, um, you know, if you guys haven't seen it, we've done interview with him in the past, um, you know, about case law and really a lot of different things uh, when it comes to how to fight parental alienation in court, even different angles of fighting it so that you not actually have to go to court, for example, or other ways of uh, fighting it, different angles. So that, that have been very helpful. So for parents that haven't seen it, I definitely encourage you guys to look for those videos in our videos tab on our Facebook page victim to hero now. Um, I, I please let me know that you can hear me and let me know where you guys are calling in from uh, i'm curious how many of you guys are actually in Canada and where about in Canada, so thank you so much um, Brian so I mean this is a, a lot of things that we're hoping to cover today, um, I mean pretty broad stroke. Um, so let's talk about the legal development, like what are you seeing right now in Canada in the recent days? Okay, um, so first, the first thing I'm going to point out is when you and I were picking the subject matter for today's chat, and I was thinking about it, there actually is a remarkable overlap. These aren't necessarily three distinct areas, because the legal remedies that a court is is going to try and struggle with, in large part, are are, are always going to involve um, some psychosocial um, guidance for the family and uh, some therapy of some sort, or at least making sure that all of the available therapeutic interventions have been tried. Um, and then since by definition, we're talking about a fractured family that's not able to um, kind of reorient itself and restructure itself after separation in a healthy manner. Um, and, and nobody else has been able to uh, impose that healthy family structure. Uh, the court's going to have to do so in order to produce what one would think the common goal always is that the children exit childhood with bonded relationships with both parents. So in terms of the overlap amongst these three topics, let me show you how it maps out. And I'll, I'll use as a frame of reference um, a five-week trial that I concluded earlier this year, and we got the decision on April 6th. So it's very, very timely. And it's a 64-page trial decision. And even then, it doesn't do justice, obviously, to all of the evidence that went in the case. Uh, we had uh, Professor Jennifer Harmon, who you've had on your show, uh, testify on our side. And then there was um, a um, professor of social work who testified for the other side, where it seemed that the focus of his testimony is to convince the court not to impose a protective separation, even though all other remedies had failed. And the professionals who had looked at the family said, further outpatient therapy is, is useless. The only thing that's going to work is a protective separation. And as most of your viewers know, it actually is a very effective intervention. And if it goes well, the separation period can even be less than 90 days. But regardless, it's always meant as an interim or temporary remedy. It's not like one parent's been severed and we replace that with the other parent being severed. The idea is to uh, repair the children's relationship, make it resilient, and then reintroduce the favored parent, monitor for any regression, and the job's done only when you then have two equal, healthy, happy homes and the family moves on in a way that other families with no assistance whatsoever are able to restructure in a healthy fashion after separation. So, and then you look backwards and you say, what a waste. 
four years of litigation, many, many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars spent only to wind up where if people had been thinking long term instead of being dominated by their emotions, that's where we would have wound up. Okay. And so we take that learning. We hope to apply that to other families and other cases. So, sorry, sorry, hold on, if you don't mind, if I can sure. just clarify for the audience, because um, I know there's a lot of different people that may not, uh, that are new. Actually, we do notice there's a lot of people that just kind of discover our page for the first time and they may not be familiar. So when Brian mentioned about um, the separation, what it is, is that um, when you found um, a situation where a child is in this uh, with this alienators who is very malicious and you know with this long campaign um it is psychological trauma psychological abuse to the child and so the best way of uh, resolving this is to actually for the court to order uh, what what he was talking about is reversing custody for a, at least for a temporary period taking the child away from the alienators to give the child a break from that control because the alienate, if you're trying to fix the situation, if the child's still under the control of the alienators, then that is almost impossible to fix. Let's you have that therapeutic uh, treatment for the child. So um, the best treatment that have been found for severe cases is to actually remove the child from the alienators for a, at least a period of time, usually um, around 90 days, or maybe like Brian just talked about, it could be shorter, depends on that progress. Um, and I, and thank you for everyone for calling in. So David is from Toronto. Uh, Panip is actually from India. Um, Wes is from Babi, Barry, sorry, Barry, Ontario. Uh, we also have Claudia from Texas. Thank you. And I saw Bobby um, asking about New York, um, asking for a therapist in New York. Um, so, okay, sorry, please go back yeah. to... Um, to this particular case, and that sounds like a very uh, complex case. There, it, it was and it wasn't. I mean, it was it was complex in the sense that it took five weeks of trial to figure it all out, um, and and receive all kinds of evidence. But it wasn't complicated in its fundamentals. So, since it's very fresh and um, uh, the issues were thoroughly canvassed with extensive law and cross-examination, lots of experts testifying. We can use that as an example. What is the state of our law today? Well, it's pretty settled that you can have families that get stuck and, and the children are reacting in a maladaptive fashion to a separation. And that could be part of the primary influence of either parent. Um, but even where both parents have made some mistakes, there usually is a, a, we search for what the primary cause is of the family dysfunction and the fact that it's stuck. So the first takeaway, what we've learned from these cases is we know the family's stuck and we're searching for why the family's stuck but it's the fact that the family couldn't unstick itself that often gets overlooked. And so you say to yourself, it's not a natural situation to be in. It must be being maintained by some forces or some cognitive distortions. And in the typical case, like the one that I, I, I just successfully argued, Lots of people have weighed in. Judges have spoken to the families at prior conferences, and there may have been a prior motion. In this case, there was even a con an interim consent order that was meant to help. And then you have the various mental health practitioners in various disciplines, therapist, assessor, potential therapist who weighed in. And yet, despite all of that, the family could not get healthy. And so you say to yourself, why? Why didn't experienced therapists, one couldn't uh, solve it, the other one wouldn't take it on because she assessed the family as too far gone and that it did need this sort of structural intervention. 
So you say, why? And it's a more sophisticated question than just who's primarily at fault. And can it be as simple as saying, it's one of two scenarios. Either there's a, a, a parent who's alienating the kids and that's why they're exhibiting such abhorrent and unempathetic behavior, which is very troubling for their future. Or is it the other parent repartnered too quickly or their parenting style is too rigid, et cetera. And unfortunately, those who don't specialize in the area often approach it in that simplistic fashion. It's bucket A or bucket B. And those are the families that ultimately really don't get the help that they need because it's often way more nuanced. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, you have children who start down a path of losing a parent. And obviously the affected parent is, is desperate to stop that and reverse it. And then you have the favored parent who they may not be actively alienating and they may really not want to harm the relationship with the other parent, but they're powerless to stop this maladaptive reaction on the part of the children. It's taken on a life of its own and they are the only parent, the favorite parent, who can turn it around. Therapists can't turn these things around because they have no authority over, over the kids. And seeing a therapist once a week, which is about the last thing in the world a kid wants to do, they just tune out or they go back into their pattern the minute they're out of the therapist's office. So the therapist really can't do what judges hope and expect them to do. And the favorite parent is disempowered. They've basically lost all parental authority. They can beg and plead. They can offer some guidance. But because the kids aren't listening to them, and if they push back, then the kids won't even come to see them. They can't impose boundaries. They don't have the opportunity to offer incentives for better behavior. And they certainly can't impose consequences because that'll just reinforce the kid's narrative. So they're disempowered. The therapist really didn't have a chance right from the get-go. So the only person who can turn it around <clears throat> is the favored parent. So you get inside the favored parent's head and they're probably still hurting from the separation. So they're not 100% very motivated to stop, even if they don't, don't really want things to get very bad, they're not going to expend a lot of effort. Or they see this train wreck happening, but they don't have the language, they don't have the tools, they don't have the concepts to talk it through with the children to, to turn it around. And if, if the other professionals trying to help the family, the lawyers who may have their own motivations, um, the longer it goes on, the worse it gets, the higher the bills. And uh, the professionals trying to help the family, well, if they don't really have real expertise and be real smart, because these are very challenging then they can't help the family either. And you wind up with a family that just keeps, it just keeps getting worse and worse and everything falls apart. So in the midst of all of this, you have the legal system, which is not a therapeutic system. It's not a rehabilitative sort of process. It was built for commercial litigation. And we're trying to help these fractured families in a system that wasn't built for it, that doesn't have the, the the tools that itself doesn't have the language. So it's a perfect storm. Now, if you have a well thought out, well argued case, you try conventional therapy with a very experienced therapist, you get a forensic assessment, 
You try another therapist who does a clinical intake to see, am I going to take it on? And writes a report saying why they're not going to take it on. Well, you, then you get the result of my recent case. It was pretty well an overwhelming case, despite the fact that it took five weeks um, and, and was really fought vehemently. There was really only one answer. We're going to have to give protective separation a chance. And so you ask yourself, why did it get to that point? And interestingly, that was the one thought that was probably most influential on the court. Because in the judgment, it says, this is the judge speaking, I kept asking myself, why can't the, I'll be neutral, favored parent, just get the kids to stop acting so abhorrently, so unempathetically, so obviously incorrectly, and the favored parent was just power, powerless, like nothing, nothing happened. And, and, and so at the end of the day, that was in a, in a soft sense, the determining factor in the judge's mind. And so that sort of just, is that a legal argument? Not really, okay? Although it builds on the obligations of co-parents. Um, is that a therapeutic argument? Kind of, but not really, right? It's really talking about the parent um, using parental skills and, and being motivated to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. So there's elements of law, elements of therapy, elements of just practical interpersonal dynamics in, in possibly the most influential part of the whole thing for the judge. And so I'm coming back to that first point that I made that even though we're talking about developments in each of these three areas, they necessarily overlap. And once again, it's too simplistic to divide up the responses. Okay, the lawyer, you're going to do this. And, and the therapist, you're going to do that. And the parenting coach, you're going to do this. And the parents, you're going to do that. It's a multi-systemic, multi-dimensional problem. And similarly, a multi-systemic, multi-dimensional response. And that means if anybody's going to help these families, they have to know as much about therapy as the therapist. They have to know as much about parenting as a professor in a family studies program at a university. And they have to know as much law as, as the best lawyers. It's extremely demanding and hence the need for a specialist for these very fractured families. So let me then, Petra, break it down into the three components, even though I've really made the point for your listeners here today that you have to look at it not as silos, as, as, as a multi-systemic response. The law continues to develop in a favorable manner. The more decisions we get where this sort of insightful thinking is expressed in a lengthy decision, the better. Um, in, in Canada, um, in most provinces, the courts can take what's called judicial notice about PA. So um, uh, you don't even have to bring an expert. The courts understand what PA is and you don't have to prove it to them. They know what it is. They know that it's bad. There are thousands of decisions just simply recognizing it as something that unfortunately happens that one judge can then rely on. You can even rely on an expert's testimony in a different PA case. So our, our law is just about there. We also have a developing body of cases that says, don't wait for a trial. Don't force families to go through four years of nonsense just to get the one remedy that has been proven to work. So. Um, that's very hopeful as well. And therefore, in many of the Canadian provinces, we can get these protective separations imposed at, at an earlier stage and don't have to go all the way to a trial. So 
um, what more could you ask of a legal system than that it uh, will, while it, it is not bound to follow decisions from other provinces, in Canada, if there's a very insightful decision, you, you can put it in, you can refer to it, and it will be hopefully of significant persuasive merit. So we have a great legal system in Canada for these cases, and it continues to evolve because of the principle of relying on prior jurisprudence. And recently I wrote an article about a 1991 case out of Montreal uh, because the judge had recently passed and I kind of did a in memoriam article. And when you read that decision, it's like no different than the case that I just argued 30 years later. All the principles are there, all the knowledge is there. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's heartening that a judge that long ago where the surrounding law was much less developed could nail it that well that it stands the test of time. And on the other hand, if there was that sort of insight 30 years ago, how unfortunate that we lost so many families, we lost so many kids in the interim. So it's also kind of a work in progress. On, on looking at the therapeutic front, just in and of itself, um, have we made progress? Yes. You can point to some people with true expertise in these areas in each province, but in each city, certainly not. And enough of them that this is an accessible uh, service for these families in crisis, absolutely not. So the biggest challenge in the therapeutic world, there are a lot of practitioners who purport to be able to help these families, but really can't and wind up doing more harm than good. And far too few who really know what they're doing and know that traditional therapeutic models are not only going to fail, they're actually going to make matters worse. You need something much more directive in, in nature. And I don't know if I've done that talk for you. I've certainly done it for many other organizations as well. How do you structure an intervention short of a protective separation that is evidence-based that it will work? What are the elements of that? Actually, that would be a great talk. No, you haven't, you haven't talked about well, that. Well, then, um, since for today, we're trying to cover like a broad uh, ground, i would be happy to come back and explain what the elements of that are and how to get that to work. Yeah, please. Yeah, if okay. we could schedule another because okay. today I, I also do have to end at um like at exactly one hour mark because yeah yeah um but okay. but yeah that would be a great talk because I know a lot of parents um would love to learn that yeah all right so I'm happy um, to and, do and, that and you brought up such a such an important point and it, it's the same situation in the U S and anywhere else actually is that there are not enough professionals that like mental health professional that can fix this situation and parents reach out all the time like, I mean in the chat room we see Bobby here trying to ask you know where do I send my children to because you know these therapists can't fix this problem and and that's something that I'm always very scared is at the same time because there's, there's such a demand there's so many people outside that are not qualified that standing by and trying to make money out of the victims and it's really freaked me out yeah. So, I mean, just to give people a little teaser about what that presentation is going to look like. There's a difference between therapy and helping one of these families restructure right down to its fundamental elements. Therapy, you have a willing patient who goes to see a therapist and there's this implicit deal or understanding between patient and therapist called the therapeutic alliance. And in the therapeutic alliance, I let my guard down. I tell you my deepest, darkest secrets, what's bothering me, why. And in return, you promise not to judge me, not to push me out of my comfort zone, not to move me, me along faster than I'm capable. 
And then together we kind of walk this journey of discourse and see if you can get me to a happier place. Now, think about the referrals in these troubled families. Firstly, the patients don't want to be there. The kids don't want to be there. They're being forced to be there. The favorite parent doesn't want to be there and actually doesn't want it to work in the first place. And if you have a therapeutic alliance of, I won't push you out of your comfort zone, I won't push you too fast, well, that's going to mean you're never going to get to the finish line of where you want to go. You have to change behavior. So just at its top level elements, therapy is actually not the answer, but judges don't understand what therapy is and what a directive mandate is. And, and just, you know, basically say, don't expect the legal system to come up with solutions for all these fractured families. Get out of my court, go do therapy. And, and that just empowers the favorite parent. So that's just the teaser of what we'll get into next time. Now, in the psychosocial realm, this is where I get into the parenting because it is the parenting that created the problem in the first place. And it's the parenting that's gonna really be the solution at the end of the day. And the mental health practitioner can be a guide and suggest things. So, and, and the most counterintuitive part is that it's the favorite parent who has to come to the rescue and save the day. So how do you, how do you incent a favorite parent? They're holding all the cards, they're usually quite glib and present well. I'm sure many of your other speakers have, have described the persona of a favorite parent. Smooth, they can convince anybody of anything. And then the targeted parent is a wreck, is a mess because they're in the course of losing their kids. They don't present well. Many of them have full-blown PTSD. And somehow someone's supposed to be able to think their way through all that. So it, it it's just not the place to be. So let me explain what I mean about the parenting and how do we incent the favored parent to be part of the solution? Well, the first thing is, there's a great line from the movie Apollo 13, failure is not an option. And you may remember the flight director played by Ed Harris, his character says that. And, and, and it looked dire and there were no answers. And he just challenged everybody. Failure is not an option. So we then have to give the favored parent the incentives to be the hero, okay? How better than the victim to hero website? I'm gonna try and lay it out here for all the favored parents. And what's their incentive? couple of things. Number one, even though they seem to be holding all the cards and everything's going their way, they're also spending a lot of money, their share of the therapy costs and their share of the legal costs, and they'd like to bring it to an end. But so long as the target parent is still in there fighting for life with the children, it's not going to end. So we can offer them a financial incentive to helping us solve the problem. And a second way we can offer them a financial incentive is to say, my kids are more important to me than anything. And there's obviously we're fighting over property, we're fighting over support, we're fighting over some financial stuff. I'll be prepared to compromise there if you can be part of the actual solution on the child side, because that's what's really important to me. So we can even offer them a financial incentive there. And then as with most things, you only get behavioral changes when people have downside. It's not enough to just provide incentives to a favorite parent. You have to have downside. Anytime you wanna get anybody to do anything, there has to be some downside to them continuing the way they're continuing. And the downside is frankly, to show them that 
these kids will be inevitably damaged if this doesn't turn around. They may win, but they'll lose for winning and they'll have damaged kids the rest of their lives. But secondly, that you're not going to give up and you are going to go for a protective separation and, and they may lose. So here's where we come back to the parenting. So a favored parent says, but I'm not alienating. I really am not alienating. The kids have legitimate grievances. The pushback from the other side is, whatever those grievances are, they don't justify the children acting the way they're acting nor did they cause it because the kids are acting too extreme. Um, I'm sure you've had some of your other guests point to the fact that truly abused children actually don't reject the parent. It's only in cases of artificial estrangement that we get this sort of, I never want to speak to them again. I don't want anything to do with them. I'll turn my back on them if I see them. So you have to be able to make the case that you may think you're not alienating and you may even not be alienating, but you're still the cause. And, and that may, you know, you have to actually convince their lawyer that there's a chance they may lose in court. But I've alluded to something that is very subtle that the non-specialist won't be able, won't even see it. How? can you challenge a favored parent in court if you can't prove that they're actually alienating? How do you get that sort of proof? You have to put a webcam in their house and see the bad mouthing. And of course, we just can't do that. So what are the tools to prove that a parent is failing as a co-parent and that for the children's own sake, it's the same remedy to, to make sure that they come out of childhood with bonded relationships with both parents and mentally and emotionally healthy. What are those other tools if I can't prove a classic case of alienation, but I still have massively dysfunctional parent-child relationships? What if it's a case of enmeshment as opposed to alienation? And enmeshment is the diffusion of normal, healthy boundaries between parent and child. So it, it comes out of family systems thinking. So if you look at a family system, it has hierarchies, it has boundaries, and the family systems theorists of the 70s which is now part of, of traditional accepted psychology, have defined all of that for us. So there's lots of references out there where you could find what healthy family structure and healthy family relations look like. And, and if you can show that it's an enmeshed, I have one case going on now um, where it's as much enmeshment as it is alienation still produces a terrible harmful result and it still is destructive of the relationship between the children and the targeted parent. So it doesn't matter that it might not fit a standard alienation diagnosis, even though there's lots of evidence of that. It's just as bad. So if you point out, and here's the secret sauce, education. With education comes responsibility. So you point out to the favored parent and their counsel, look, here's another hypothesis about what's going on. And I need you and your client to read this article and this article and consult this person and this person because of the children's individuation is being crushed and they're missing out on some of the major developmental milestones of childhood. That Those alone are reason for a timeout from the enmeshed parent. It's not only alienation, it's any sort of harmful behavior. Another more subtle sort of failure on the part of the 
favorite parent? Because I've already made the point that quite often they're the only one who can turn this around. But they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the language. They don't know conceptually how to turn it around. So what if there really are faults in the targeted parent? Um, targeted parent you know, has a more structured parenting style, but is just too inflexible. Targeted parent um, has to travel on business a lot. It's not their fault, but it is what it is. And it, say, impacted on the parent-child relationship historically. So is there a safe harbor? Because remember, I'm trying to incentivize the favored parent to be part of the solution. And if they feel they got a bunch of safe harbors, I'm covered here because um, look at the fault of the targeted parent. And I'm covered here, look at the fault of the targeted parent. I need to take that away. No, you still have to fix it because they're both of your children and you're going to be left with the damaged children in future and you're the only one who can fix it. So noblesse oblige, so to speak. So what if I could point out to the favored parent, yes, this happened, this incident happened, but your kids are way overreacting and they're not able to just let it go. It is what it is, but they need to learn to accept an apology and let it go instead of anchoring on it. Because if that's the attitude they take, they're going to have all kinds of failed relationships in their intimate lives in future. And it's, it's not the moral and spiritual thing to do, particularly when it's apparent that they're holding this grudge against. And, and that's what you need as the favored parent to get them to do. Overreacting and anchoring, it's got to come to an end. Then the disrespect, the failure to treat a parent as a parent, it doesn't matter what the grievance is. You're not allowed when that parent is talking to you to spin your chairs around and present your back or pull your hoodie up over your head, which is what was happening in, in the case that, that I just successfully won. It does, there is no excuse for that. So if we say to the favored parent, you know what the judge is going to say when that comes out? Why didn't you, doesn't matter that they're mad at their father or their mother and they have good reasons to be mad. That behavior is utterly unacceptable. And you're going to be blamed for that behavior, not the other parent that the children are justifiably angry at. Because the behavior itself is a different issue than, than what the children are saying entitles them to act that way. And so you can see it's, it's an educative process to get the favored parent out of their comfort zone, to give them an incentive, to show them what the downside is, to really show them how damaged their kids are going to be in future. And they may win, and the kids will only be with them for the rest of their lives. But at what cost? And then you have to take the favored parent who may finally get it, but they don't have the tool. They're not a psychologist. They don't have the tool. Frankly, most psychologists wouldn't get this. So what do I do? What do I say? How do I turn it around? The kids have kind of chosen this path. And then you need to actually script it for them. And I mean, literally scripted. Here's what you're going to say to them. And if their response is this, it, it's almost like, um, you know, one of those um, cold call sellers. We all get the calls all the time. No matter what we say, they're right in there because they've been pre-scripted. We're just trying to get off the phone. They know exactly what to say to keep us on the phone. And we've all experienced that. That's the way it's got to be. 
because the children's responses are pretty well predictable. And when you can then educate the favored parent as to what they must do, now you flip the case. So you can't prove an alienation case, but you've identified the problematic behavior. You've shown the favored parent how the children's problematic behavior can be turned around. But then they don't do it. And you've shown them the damage to the kids that's going to result. So I've now proven my case that they really are the problem. It's not an alienation case, but it's the favorite parent that's the problem. Because they're the only one that can fix it and prevent the damage to the children. And the only other way to fix it is to temporarily take, take the kids away from them. Now, that level of sophistication might be beyond what courts today are prepared to do. So this is kind of a rhetorical question. Are courts going to go as far as I said they probably should go in an effort to protect the kids from their parents' own troubled breakup? So it's a fault of omission instead of a fault of commission. Not your typical alienation case, but rather everybody is saying to you, your kids are acting abhorrently and disrespectfully and they're anchoring on mistakes. I call it the pounce. All parents make mistakes, but children don't sit in judgment of their parents and hold grudges. That will have lifelong ramifications. So it, this is a very sophisticated and kind of bleeding edge narrative that is nonetheless essential that could fit this recent case that I one where the judge remarked that at the end of the day, one of the most compelling things is, look how your kids are acting. They won't go in the house. They won't eat their father's food. They won't go in the car and go to an activity with him. They turn their backs on him. I really don't care what caused all of this. He can't get that to change. The therapist can't get that to change. Only you can get that to change. But you won't do it. So when I was cross-examining, in this case, it was, it was a mom who, who kind of fell down on the job. And I kept saying, well, like, what are, you, what are you doing? Do you explain, do you use your parental authority with the children? And I got, I got, I got some spin, like, it's not my parenting style to use consequences and stuff. So, yeah but your kids are acting terribly. I guess you're going to have to, despite the fact that it's not your parenting style. And the best I could get her to say was that I keep telling them, it's okay to go in your dad's car. It's okay to eat his food. It, it, it's okay to talk with him. It, it's okay to sit at his table and not demand that he bring your food into this little private room that you closet yourselves in so that you don't have to interact with him. It's okay. So, okay, ma'am, um, that's not working. Do you ever use misattunement in your own home? In other words, get angry at your kids for this abhorrent behavior. And it, it became quite apparent through the questions and answers that no, she's not doing that. Um, and, and that's one of the elements of, of parenting. Hey, I've asked you five times now, get in your father's car. So now you're not only disrespecting him, you're disrespecting me. Don't push me, get in his car. 
that wasn't happening. Um, and so that played into the judge's ultimate conclusion that I've, that I've described. And that's not about alienation. That's about the children have taken on habitual behaviors that are unacceptable, that are harmful to their own moral compass. And the favored parent is doing nothing about it. And you can get them there even if you haven't been able to prove that it's an alienation case by educating and highlighting where the children are going down a bad path with bad ramifications for the future and exactly what the narrative is that is necessary to turn that around and then showing that it's a crime of omission. And when we can get the law there and we can get therefore the therapeutic community to throw that in the mix, you'll be able to save a lot more families. And again, it's kind of a, they reinforce each other. This thought process needs to be reinforced by more judges saying, I'm going to fault you as much by what you don't do as what you're actually doing. And then, and then it can all work because this, when you articulate it the way I've just done, and it's only because I've done hundreds of these cases, it doesn't really sound that complicated. So I'll just summarize for everybody. You want to change in human behavior? Provide incentives and provide downside. Articulate the goal and why. Provide the scripts in there. Show them how to do it, not just over to you. It's your problem. The therapist couldn't solve it. Here, here's why you should solve it. Go solve it. You have to go further. Here's the text. Here's the narrative. Here's what you say exactly to the kids and we'll all work with you to reinforce that and then I'll make you the hero of the family saga and one day the ultimate incentive your kids will thank you for having saved their relationship with the targeted parent you'll actually get the credit but I'm not aware of too many other people in any other forums where what I'm telling you here today is actually being articulated. It's a much more sophisticated discourse. And, and I don't know how many courts would yet go that far, like that we're imposing obligations on a favored parent. They're not bad mouthing. And the current situation is they didn't cause the current situation. It, just, it happened, but I'm going to fault them for not solving it. Um, the simple answer is yes, that is an obligation that should be imposed on a co-parent. But uh, to be fair, I'd have to say I don't think the law is there yet. But my recent case is it could certainly be put forward with precedential value on this very point. And then, you know, we can save more families and more kids that way. So there I you are. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. Really, I think it's brilliant because parents, and like you said, there's a lot of things that are going on in the alienator's home behind closed doors that you can't prove. So, you know, parents always going uphill on this battle, trying to prove something that is very difficult to prove. And of course, alienators, you know, there are those that are unintended, you know, they, they, they're not intentionally alienating, but there are those that are intentionally alienating. Even those, they will hide behind the children. It's like, oh, no, it's not me. It's a child that did this, right? So this is brilliant because you then still put it back to them you know, with some negotiation. And like you said, obviously human behavior is avoiding uh, consequences and, you know, seeking pleasure. So if you offer both of those, you, you definitely tap into that human psychology. And then at the same time, you put that responsibility and then go, okay, maybe it's not you that at fault, but you're not doing your job. So I think that's brilliant. And 
a lot of parents, like you said, fighting in court for years, going in and out of court. And even the system, even the judge, when they see a problem, they feel stuck. They don't know how to solve this. So I think that is brilliant. Um, I'm curious, though, um, what about, do you have any comment? Because it seemed like those would work for cases where the alienators are not extremely malicious to the point that they create false allegation of child abuse toward the targeted parents, you know, sexual or physical abuse. So how would parents, do you have any comments on that? And I know we don't have a lot of time. Yeah, unfortunately, for that sort of dynamic, where, I mean, that is a classic alienation case. So if, if you can show that there's a pattern of false allegations and they're really meaningful and they're really malicious and they're highly damaging, well, then that is child abuse. And you respond, you know, I'm sure many of your speakers have said you have to conceptualize a PA case as a child abuse case as opposed to a custody and access litigation case. And so you treat it accordingly. Prom promoting false allegations in children is child abuse. In the language of the modern legislation, it's also domestic violence and coercive control. And you need to protect the children from that. And you do that using a protective separation. So um, for those people that are that malicious, they will not be open to the sophisticated, let's all partner and save the children. Um, and it should be quite apparent when you're dealing with one of those cases that the only answer is the false allegations have to go away and there has to be responsibility for having made the false allegations in the first place. If they're going to go down fighting to the last day saying, I don't care that the police and the child protection authorities accept that there was no sexual abuse of the children, I will believe that to my dying days. You just can't co-parent with that person. You just got to protect the children from that person. Um, it's unfortunate, but um, that's the remedy that's called for. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I know a lot of parents are asking about cases that Brian uh, refer to. So we actually had an event um, where Brian came in and actually walked through a lot of case law and he cited those cases. So if you wanted the information on that, please look into our videos tab uh, and look for Brian's past uh, interview with us because he walked through those specific cases, explained what those cases was about and what the rulings on and why and all that. So, you know, uh, go back into that video and you'll see the list of the cases that uh, in Canada anyway, um, because we had an event specifically about case law. Um, and, and, and I apologize. I, I actually have a meeting with an US, U.S. Senator today, um, in a few minutes to fight the, um, I'm, I don't know if you're law. familiar with Cadence Law. Very yeah. familiar. It would it would be it's firstly it's founded on complete falsehoods, but you can see they don't want courts to have the ability to impose protective separations. It's the mere fact that courts can potentially do that that is one of the most highly motivating factors in dealing with either the as I'll put it the sins of commission and the sins of omission. If you take that remedy away, it's, it, it's gonna make my job much more difficult. Um, and and I, I applaud you, Petra, for weighing in on, on that. Um, I, I just don't think that the legislatures um, were, were given um, a full and proper background. You know, obviously there was a tragedy but tacking on this piece to a tragedy that had nothing to do with this piece is uh, is equally bad. So good luck in dealing with the center. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, our team's been working really hard and it's actually, uh, we, we've been making a lot of good progress in uh, Pennsylvania um, and Illinois. I, we actually managed to change certain languages to be a lot more favorable to victims of parental alienation, but at the federal level, we'll, we'll still see how it goes. But thank you so much for being here today. Um, I, I know there's a lot of unanswered question in the chat room. Brian will come back. I, you know, I please, um, we'll, we'll figure out a time very soon. And thank you so much, Brian, for being here. And parents, 
I do apologize because yeah, we, we have to go and fight this cadence log thing, so we can't continue today. But um, thank you so much, Brian. Um, and and yeah, please come back and it'd be it'd be my pleasure. Happy to come back and explain what this sort of structured directive intervention looks like, and maybe what we could do is have an extended period of time where I just take your listeners' questions. Yeah, that would be amazing. Thank you, because uh, there are so many questions in the chat room. And then for parents, if you're not already a part of our mailing list, please join our mailing list on our website, victimtohero.com. Uh, you know, if you go to the top right, there's a place where you put in your email. Um, and please help us share this video and like this video and let us know your questions. And then I'll make sure we go through that before we start the next event with Brian. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you so much, Brian. Today is a Canadian holiday and yet you'll still, you know, give us this time. So thank you. Really appreciate you. My pleasure. I hope it's helpful to people. Thank you. Okay. Bye everyone. And we'll talk to you guys again very, very soon. Thank you, Brian. Take care.